on a Sunday morning, isn't it? Yes. Thank the Lord for his day and what a privilege to come together and to worship the Lord and so glad that you're with us today. today. I want you to turn with me to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 18. I want to begin with the first verse of this chapter, and I want to read down through verse number 8. Jeremiah, that Old Testament book, chapter 18, beginning with verse number 1. If you found it and you feel like you can, would you stand for the reading of God's Word this morning? The word which came to Jeremiah <clears throat> from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then... I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. Let's pray. We thank you, our Father, this morning. For the privilege to be in your house. We're thankful, Lord, for the day that you ever gave to us the message, the message of the gospel that caused a change in my own life, and we're grateful for it. And our Father, today we thank you that this grace is extended to every individual today. There's not one that needs to be without, because as the word says, your arm is not shortened that it cannot save, your ear is not heavy that it cannot hear, and we're grateful this morning that it's for whosoever will. I pray that you will anoint us, help us as we preach your word today, and we'll give you praise in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. God is speaking to Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a prophet that had, had uh, given a number of prophecies, of course, to the nation of Israel. And God is saying to Jeremiah, I want you to go down to the potter's house. I have a message there that I want you to receive. And Jeremiah goes to the potter's house. Now, I've never, I've seen a little bit of a potter working with clay on the wheel. I'm not experienced with those that have, have done lots of pottery work. I've seen a little bit and seen of them working on the wheel, and it's quite intriguing. But as Jeremiah goes down to the potter's house, there's some things that he recognizes about this particular potter. And let's look at it this morning. First of all, I believe that Jeremiah recognizes the ability of this potter. I'm sure this was not the first mass of clay that the potter had in his hands that he was experimenting with. For I believe that this potter's house was probably a potter's house that had a reputation. 
I know that there are certain things that are in our house, and no doubt certain things that are in your house, ladies, that it comes from a particular place, and it comes from a place of reputation, and you pride it because of where it was made, and the name that's on it. I would dare to think that this potter was probably that kind of a potter, and he had great ability to make wonderful, wonderful pottery. I not only notice his ability, but I noticed that he was skillful and steady with his hands, and he knew the consistency of the clay. I grew up in a home where I had a, the most wonderful mother. Now, I think I had probably the most wonderful mother anyone could have had. That's because she was my mother, and you feel that way about your mother. But my mother would bake our bread. As I was growing up, we hardly ever knew what it was to buy a loaf of bread from the store. My mother would make our own bread. And after I was married, and, and uh, my wife and I were, uh, we were pastoring, I think, at the time, and I said to my mother, I said, Mother, I would like to have the recipe for your homemade bread. She said, John, I don't have one. Now, you ladies probably know what she was talking about, right? Yes. I said, Mother, how do you know when it's right? Because I would watch her as she was kneading the dough. She would take her fingers, and she had a cup of water there, and she had a canister of flour, and she would take her fingers, and she would dip it in the water, and she would sprinkle a little bit of water on it, and then she would work some more with her hands. Then I would watch her, she would take her hand, and she'd get a little bit of flour, and she'd sprinkle it over that dough. And then she'd work some more. She repeated this over and over. Mother, how do you know when it's right? She said, I just know when it feels right. And again, you ladies understand that. And I believe the potter in this particular lesson this morning as he was working with this clay, he knew just exactly when it was feeling right. He knew when it was cooperating with him, when he could shape it just like he wanted to. And in his mind, he knew what he was attempting to make. Now, I'm not a potter, but I do like to work with wood. And I've set out to make some things. In fact, just recently, I made a few picture frames to be hung there on the campus of Penview Bible Institute. I was asked to make them. As I was working on those picture frames, those frames were going to uh, surround the portraits of two great men. Men that gave their life uh, there at Penview Bible Institute. One, many of you know, Barry Mason, still alive, been there for now about 47, 48 years. And the other was a Dean McIntyre. Some of you may have heard of him. Dean McIntyre was there for 25 years as a professor. And the building was, was uh, uh, just constructed, and it was named in their honor. And I knew that those pictures were going to be looked at lots and lots of people. And I knew that as I was making these picture frames, if I didn't have them perfect, do you know who was going to look bad on? Me. I'd been president there for 28 years, and, and the building was, was a vision of mine, and, and I wanted to see it completed because I felt like it was something that needed to be on the campus there for the students, and, uh, and I felt like I have to give it time. And my wife would watch me, and she'd say, Honey, it's taking you so long. Well, it probably did because as I cut those angles, I would, it just didn't quite suit me and I would cut it again and, and just put it, and put it in the clamps and make sure that those 45s would come together just perfectly because I knew it was going to be seen by a lot of people. But you're not everything that I have set out to do with wood has turned out quite like I've wanted it. 
This potter knew what he wanted to do. He was shaping the vessel. And in the process of shaping the vessel, he detected something in the clay that was foreign. Something that was there that should not have been. And he knew that as that pottery would turn on the wheel and that little, uh, probably a little pebble of some kind that was in there, as he would turn it, it was going to scar the vessel. And the potter, as he looked at it, saw that it was not cooperating like it should have been. That potter made a decision. My grandson who is now is 20, 20 years old. In fact, he's uh, preaching for me this morning, probably in the pulpit right now at my church back home, and I'm so happy about that. But he was much younger, just a lad growing up. He was in art class. He had, had great ability to draw, and he was drawing the picture of a horse. And as he was drawing it, it just wasn't turning out like he wanted it to turn out, and he's a perfectionist, and he took that piece of paper and he wadded it all together and threw it in the waste can. The potter could have done the same thing with that piece of clay. When the clay was not cooperating, he could have taken that piece of clay, opened the back door to his shop, and tossed it out there on the pile of what was no good. But I'm glad the potter didn't do that. Amen. He said, since I can't make it exactly like I want to make it, I will give it a second chance, and I'll make another vessel from it. I believe the skillfulness of this potter as Jeremiah was watching him, stood out to Jeremiah in such a way that Jeremiah was able to compare the skillfulness and the patience to the Heavenly Father because this potter was representing God as Jeremiah was seeing this object lesson. And instead of throwing the clay away, he gave it another chance. I'm so glad this morning that God didn't throw the clay away in working with my life. He knew the sins of my life. He knew the things that I had done. I'm glad that he didn't say there's no use, but I'll work with him. This morning... I don't know your life, and I don't know what your life might consist of. But I want you to know this morning that God does. And God knows everything. God knows the sins of an individual. God knows what is in the heart of an individual. God knows the things that you may have done. But I want you to know this morning that there is a God that looks at us and understands, no, never understands to say sin is all right, but he says, I'll give them another opportunity. I'll give them a chance. Thank God for his patience. Thank God. <clears throat> when Jesus was taken from the Garden of Gethsemane, and taken to the high priest's house, getting ready to stand trial before the crucifixion. Peter and John followed to the chief priest's house. John had gone inside. Peter stayed outside. John wasn't inside very long until he went back out and he, and I'm going to paraphrase here just a little bit, and he said, Peter, you get yourself in here. You read the scripture, that's essentially what John was saying. You get inside here, Peter. And Peter comes inside, 
the high priest's house. And a little maiden sees Peter and says, Peter, you're one of them. Peter says, no, I'm not. I'm not one of them. Another looks at Peter and says, I've seen you with him. Peter said, I don't know him. And there was one from the garden who was out there and, and had come with the soldiers to take the master. And Peter had taken his sword. And he took and he swung his sword at Malchus. And got his ear, cut off his ear. Now Peter didn't intend to just get his ear. Peter wanted more than that. But he got the ear. Jesus reached down and picked up the ear and put it back on. Now, there in the high priest's house, he looks at Peter and says, I saw you. Peter said, no, it wasn't me. I don't know this man. Now, before Peter ever denied the Lord, back a few days before this, he was with Jesus and Jesus looked at him and said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. And Peter said, I'll never do it. But when Peter denied the Lord the third time, Peter's eyes turned toward the master and Jesus looked at him and Peter's heart was convicted and he left the high priest's house and went out and the scripture says he wept bitterly because he knew he had sinned. He knew he had done wrong. Jesus was, of course, taken to Calvary. There he died on the cross. He was taken from the cross. He was put in the tomb. And on that first Easter morn, when Mary and the others went to the tomb, and they went to uh, anoint the body of Jesus some more because they didn't get the opportunity to do it all before he was, he was buried in the tomb. <clears throat> Mary saw who she thought was the gardener. And then this man looked at Mary and called her by name and said, Mary? And Mary <clears throat> recognized his voice and she says, Rabboni, Master. And Jesus says, don't touch me. I have not yet been glorified. But I want you to go to my disciples and I want you to tell them I'm alive. But he, she, he didn't stop with that message. He said, I want you to tell Peter. Do you know I believe this morning the reason he specifically said Peter? Because he was giving Peter another chance. He knew what Peter had done just three days before. He knew how Peter had denied him there in the high priest's house and, and said that he did not know him. And he told Mary, go tell my disciples and tell Peter that I am alive. Oh, I'm so glad this morning. Thank God he's the God of the second chance. There are individuals whose lives have turned away from God and you've done things you know you ought not to have done. I'm glad to tell you this morning he's the God of the second chance. There was a store owner who was tacking a sign above his door. And on the sign, it read, Puppies for Sale. A little boy appeared and asked the store owner how much the little puppies were going to be sold for. And the store owner replied, he said, they're going to be sold for anywhere from $30 to $50. The little boy reached into his pocket and pulled out some change, and he said, I have $2.37. Can I please look at the puppies? The store owner whistled, and out of the kennel came Lady, followed by five little balls of fur. One of the puppies was lagging behind. Immediately, the little boy singled out the limping puppy and said, What's wrong with that little puppy? 
The store owner explained that the veterinarian had examined the little puppy and he discovered that he did not have hip sockets and he would always, or one of the sockets, and he would always have a limp. The little boy became excited and he said, that's the little puppy I want to buy. The store owner countered and said, no, you don't want to buy that little dog. If you really want him, I'll just give him to you. The little boy got upset and looked straight in the store owner's eyes and said, I don't want you to give him to me. That little dog is worth every bit as much as all the other dogs and I'll pay full price for him. In fact, I'll give you $2.37 now and 50 cents a month until I have him paid for. The store owner countered, you really don't want to buy this little dog. He'll, he's never going to be able to run and jump and play with you like the other puppies. The little boy reached down and pulled up his pants leg and revealed a badly twisted crippled leg that was supported by a big metal brace. He looked up at the store owner and softly replied and said, well, I don't run so well myself. And the little puppy will need someone who understands. This morning, I'm so glad that Jesus understands this morning. Thank God. Amen. For when Jesus hung on the cross, what did he say? He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He looked at the Pharisees. He looked at the Sadducees. He looked at the disciples that followed afar off. Do you know what he was saying? I'll give them another chance. You ladies go to the store. <clears throat> My wife and the pastor's wife yesterday went out to an outlet, a place where they have some irregulars. They're not perfects. They went to the box, to the racks that, that they, oh yes, there were some there that I think maybe were perfect, but there were those there that were not perfect. And they were looking for a bargain. There's many a customer that looks through the bin, had no interest because of it being a full of irregulars. But thank God for the day that Jesus passed by. And he specializes this morning in irregulars. He specializes in those that are irregular. And he said, I'll take him. I'll buy him. I'll take him. I thank God for the fact that just a lad at 12 years of age, the devil already had a hook in my jaw. I had already started down the road of sin. And who knows where I would be today, Pastor, if it wouldn't have been for the grace of God. But I remember a Sunday night. I sat in the back of the church. My mother shouldn't have let me sit there, but she did that night. I sat in the back of the church with some of my brothers who were older than I. We sat there and did a lot of talking that night. But our pastor preached a strong evangelistic message. God, the Holy Spirit settled in, and I felt that convicting power of me on me and the sins that I had committed. <clears throat> I did not yield when the altar call was given. I went home. Well, I we went to bed as a family. I could not sleep. I tossed and I turned. I was under conviction. Sin had already started to wreck my life. I rolled out of bed and went over to my mother and daddy's bedroom and I said, Mother, I want you to go with me downstairs. It was in the old farmhouse. We went down to the family room. My mother said to me, John, what do you want? I said, Mother, I want to get saved. And that night, Jesus Christ came and forgave me of every sin. I'm glad, thank God, he took an irregular. I'm glad he took one who others looked by and said, I don't want him, but Jesus said, I'll take him. Amen. I'm preaching to some this morning. You look at your life and you would have to say that your life has been full of irregular things. Things that you have done that you no doubt are ashamed of. Things that you have, sins that you've committed, you said, I wish I would have never done. And you're carrying a load this morning. You're carrying a load because you know better. You know better. You know 
Some of you, no doubt, that I'm preaching to this morning, maybe grew up in the church. You knew, you know the way, but you've strayed. I'm glad this morning to tell you, Jesus Christ is the God of the second chance. Thank God. I've driven the highways enough to see trucks loaded with wrecked cars that are being hauled to the melting plant. I used to pastor in a town where there was a large steel mill. I encouraged my daughter's class to take a field trip through the steel mill. And it was my opportunity to go with them. As we walked through the steel mill, we saw the train cars outside that were full of scrap metal. We saw those, those uh, shavings that had come off the, the turnings where they were turning out the steel. They were out there on the, on the, tr on the rail cars and they looked like they weren't worth a thing. But as we walked through the steel mill, we were on a long, high catwalk and we looked down on some vats. And while there, they swung the lid of one of those vats open. Inside that vat, that uh, vat was molten steel. It was orange. They had already melted it. There was another there that the lid was closed. And on the top of that lid were electrons, just like, uh, electrodes rather, like you would, uh, those of you that have done uh, electric welding, huge rods. They would lower those rods down to the steel. Lots of volts of electricity were flowing through them. And when they got close enough, they began the arcing process. Sounded like a thousand welding rods. As those rods began to melt that steel. We went from that section of the shop into another section. There, they had, they had large furnaces. But they had a chunk of steel now. They would take that chunk of steel and they would push it into the furnace. They would let it in there until it got hot, until it was turning orange. They'd pull it out and then they had hammers and they would beat on that chunk of steel and beat on it and beat on it. What they were doing was actually stretching it. We went to another part of the plant and there, now we were in the turning section. They were turning out train axles. We could see where that chunk of steel that they had pushed into the furnace and been pulled out and hammered on now had been stretched out into a longer piece of steel and now it was put on a lathe. And they were turning out train axles and train wheels. You get outside the plant and you could see them loaded on the semis ready to go for delivery. What appeared to be those pieces of steel on the rail cars appeared, appeared to be good for nothing. But there were those that saw something good in it and said, I'll give it another chance. Thank God this morning, God gives us another chance. Thank God. Thank God. The story was told of a boy who, when he was born, he was born without ears. He played with the other little children on the street, as any other boy would do, and no one seemed to notice his defect. But when he was big enough to start to school, it only took a few days until someone noticed that he was different. The children began to make fun of him until he came home crying and said, Mom, why didn't you tell me that I didn't have ears? The mother explained that she didn't want him to feel any different than any of the other children. Days, weeks, and even years went by. And the longer it went, the more it bothered the little boy. <laughs> Dad and mom felt that 
If they would take him to a specialist, maybe something could be done. The doctor said the only thing possible would be a transplant if some ears would become available. Time seemed to pass more slowly. And with each day, the boy became more bitter. His classmates continued to poke fun until he had no friends. His grades fell and he hated to go to school. Every day, when he came in from school, he would ask if the doctor called and if he had found some ears. By this time now, the boy was in senior high school. One day, when he arrived home, his mother said, Son, I have some good news. The doctor found some ears. The date was set. The surgery was scheduled. And it was successful. The bandages were removed. And he went back to school. His whole attitude changed. Because now he was like the others. He began to study extremely hard. The students who had laughed at him now became his friends. And it was no longer a trial for him to go to school. By the time he graduated, he became number one in his class. And consequently graduated with top honors. He went on to Boston to study law. And there did fine. And got a good job. One day he received a telephone call from home. His dad was on the other end of the line. And his dad said, son, I've got some bad news for you. said, your mother passed away. The son said, I'll be home just as quickly as I can get there, dad. Son arrived home. He and dad <clears throat> were out walking around the barn. And the son was saying to dad, now dad, listen, I have a good job there in Boston. I want you to sell the farm. And I want you to move and live with me there at Boston. Dad said, son, we don't own much of this farm anymore. We sold everything that we could sell to put you through college so that you'd be successful. The son said, dad, why? Why did you do that? Dad said, son, we loved you and we wanted to see you be successful. The hour came when they together were to go for the family viewing. The father began to weep. And when he got his composure, he said, Now, son, do you remember when you were born? You were born without ears. He said, Dad, son said, Dad, how could I forget it? He said, Son, do you remember the day you came home from school and we told you that the doctor had called and ears were found for you? He said, Yes, Dad. Don't remind me of those days. He said, son, your mother and I pledged to each other that neither of us would tell you until one of us was gone. Son, would you go and brush back your mother's hair? He did and found that it was his mother who had given both of her ears that he might be successful. I know one who's done more than that for you this morning. I know one who went to the cross. I know one who died this morning that you might live. I know one who gave everything this morning that you might have hope. I know one this morning that said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do to give you a second chance. Do you know it's the devil's business to get us into trouble? It's the devil's business to get us to stray. It's the devil's business to get us involved in things that we look at and say, I wish I wouldn't have.
But I'm glad it's God's business to rescue us. And that's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, who left the ivory palaces of glory to come and die for you and die for me. Back several years ago on a Monday morning, a phone call came into our house. My wife took the call. I was outside. I was doing my chores before going to the office at the college. My wife called me and she said, Honey, your aunt is on the phone. She wants to talk to you. I said, I'll be there. I came into the house. My aunt said, John, I need you to come out to my house. She lived just a little over a mile from me. She said, I need you to come to my house. She said, I'm so under conviction, I don't know what to do. I said, I'll be there just as quickly as I can. Just give me a minute to change my clothes and I'll be there. When I got to my aunt's house, went to the front door to ring the doorbell. I could hear my aunt. She was in the living room of their ranch house. She was praying. But she stopped her prayer. She came and answered the door. She said, John, she said, I've lived a terrible life. I knew the kind of life she lived. She said, I must get saved. It was only about two weeks before that that her husband, my uncle, my father's brother, had died. She said, I must get saved. We sat in the living room. We talked for a little while. And then we began to pray. And we prayed. And we prayed. But my aunt did not get saved there that morning. She said, there's some things that I need to do, John. She said, there's some phone calls, restitutions that I need to make. I knew that because I knew her life. She lived a bad life. She was a wicked woman. I said to my aunt, I said, we're going to camp meeting tonight. Would you go with us? She said, I will. I will. I couldn't tell you the last time that she was to the camp meeting. That evening, my wife and I stopped. We picked her up. Nearly the whole way to Penn's Creek, my aunt was talking about getting saved. We got into the service, and on a Monday night, very seldom do you have an evangelist that preaches a message on hell, but he did that night. He finished the message. My aunt was sitting with my wife and we. We were sitting right down front, near the front of the tabernacle. I wondered, will my aunt go to the altar? We stood for the singing of the altar call, the invitation. I watched my aunt out of the corner of my eye, and I saw her take her purse and open her purse. She took her glasses off. She folded them, put them inside. She got some Kleenexes out. I thought that's a good sign. And my aunt, who was sitting next to my wife, started to leave the pew and came past my wife and got over to me. And I took my aunt, 79 years of age, by the arm and we together went to the altar. My aunt, again, knew the life that she had lived. She was under such heavy conviction it wasn't hard for her to pray out and cry out for mercy. While praying there at the altar that night, my aunt got back to Jesus Christ. She testified and said, I wish I would have stayed true way back there 50 years ago. She said, I could have been a blessing in the church. But she said, I thank God for having mercy on me. This morning, 
I'm glad I can tell you of one who's here with mercy. I'm glad I can tell you of one who's come this morning, who's the God of the second chance. You know where you are. You know what's in your life. You know the sins that you've committed. You know where you're at this morning spiritually. Jesus, I believe, has an outstretched arm and is saying, come back to Father's house. I want us to stand. Just play. Our Father, we thank you this morning, O oh God, for your amazing grace. We thank you today, dear Jesus, for your mercy. As I look across this congregation, I don't know these people. Some of these people I've never ever seen in my life, but you know them, Jesus. And you know why you laid this message on my heart this morning? I pray that thou will help that one to step out from where they are and make their way to an altar this morning and get back to you, O oh God. Come to you, Jesus. For you gave your life, you shed your blood that they might be saved, that they might be forgiven, that they might be made ready for heaven. Lord, we're so glad for mercy. We're so glad for grace. Grace that goes deeper than the stain has gone. Blood that goes deeper than the stain is gone. Thank God for the blood that will forgive and cleanse the heart this morning. I pray that you'll help us these next few moments. Drive the forces of evil back. And Lord, help that one to mind you today. In Jesus' name. We're not going to have any singing this morning, but our sister is going to be playing. And she's playing that old invitational hymn, Just As I Am. To you this morning, won't you come just as you are? We don't have to say we're something that we're not because we're coming to Jesus and saying, Lord, I want you to have mercy on me. I want you to have mercy on me today. I want you to forgive me this morning. You're giving me another opportunity. You're giving me a second chance. I believe this morning that God the Holy Ghost is in our midst. I sense Him. And I believe that He's speaking to you. Won't you come? Won't you give Him your life? Won't you turn your back on sin? Won't you turn your back on the way that you have faltered and failed and gone away from God? And come back to Jesus this morning. He's here. He's come to give you victory. It's just as I am without one plea. This morning, oh God, I need you. I need you. Who would be first to step out this morning? Say, I need him. I need him. I need Jesus this morning. I'm glad he died for me on the cross. I'm glad he gave his life for me on the cross. Who would be first to step out? Say, I need him. We're waiting for you this morning. We're waiting for you. Won't you come? Won't you come? Won't you give him the chance again to bring peace to your heart that you one time enjoyed? Maybe I'm speaking to somebody this morning that has never, ever been saved. This morning, you can break loose from the sins that you've committed. And he'll set you free. He'll break the chains that have you bound. He'll set you free this morning and make your life worth living. I think of a Sunday morning back a number of years ago in the church that I pastored. 
There was a young man sitting about the fourth seat back from the front. And we hadn't even got to the message yet that morning. A special song was being sung and this young man broke down in tears and his father-in-law left the seat where he was sitting and made his way to the son-in-law and got down alongside him and said, Would you like to go to the altar? He said, Yes. This young man was not raised in the church. He didn't know this way. He got up from his pew that morning and came to the altar. It was my privilege to pray with him. It didn't take him long to pray through. I looked down at his face. He looked up at me, a smile on his face. He said, Jesus forgives. That was the turning point of that man's life. God delivered him from the booze. God delivered him from the smoking. God delivered him from the everything of sin. He delivered him. Today, he's still serving Jesus Christ. This morning, we're giving you the opportunity. Won't you come? Won't you come?